Hi everyone, this is Nikita, the co-founder of SSCRD. I'm back with Space Talk. You all know Space Talk is a series of talks with the guests who are experienced in one or the other space domains. And today, I'm so happy that we are having one of the special guests. In fact, someone who is favorite of mine, who been, I mean, I've been waiting to talk to her from years and years. And uh, so let's let's listen from her. But before that, do you all want to know who is that? I'm pretty sure you all be very excited to know about her and listen to her talk. As, as I said, she's considered to be one of the most important person in the entire space domain. So I welcome Dr. Sushmita Mohanty, who is the Director General of Spaceport Sarabhai. Before I give on the entire screen to her, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Sushmita Mohanty to all of you. So she is a, a spaceship designer, serial entrepreneur, and a space diplomat. She is the only space entrepreneur in the world to have co-founded space companies on three different continents, such as Earth to Orbit in Bangalore back in 2009, and Liquifier in Vienna from 2004 and it's ongoing right now, and Moonfront um, in San Francisco started in 2001. Prior to turning entrepreneur, she worked at the International Space Station program at Boeing in California, and she did uh, start a stint at, uh, she did uh, have a short stint at NASA Johnson Space Center. In autumn 2021, she launched India's first dedicated space think tank, Spaceport Sarabhai. In 2022, when India celebrated 75 years of independence, Sushmita was one of the 75 women honored by the Indian government with the Women Transforming India Award. And she's, she's got several awards throughout the years and she's one such person who, whom I have been saying all the students to follow and listen with, with various experiences that she brings in. So as I said, this has been an exciting moment for me. And now I welcome Dr. Sushmita Mahanti. Uh, Sushmita, thank you so much for accepting our request um, in your busy schedule. Again, I, I, I would be keep like i would keep thanking you the entire show so again welcome 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 to sscrd space talk thank you thank you nikita thank you very much um i think what i'll do this uh, with the talk today is i'll walk you through my life's trajectory to give you a sense of what it is that uh, I have been passionate about in the last 25 plus years of my professional career. Uh, so let's begin with with this slide, where awesome. I've, cho I've, I've chosen, um, I've juxtaposed two photographs, two photographs here. here. On the left, on the it's left, me, it's in, me my in my Earth buggy, Earth buggy. and on my and right, on my right, you can see, you can see Eugene, Eugene Cernan, Cernan, who was in the last, was in the Apollo, last mission, Apollo mission, which landed, which on, the landed moon, on the moon in December, in December of, 1972. of 1972. So the idea, so the idea is to give you a bit of a vintage of, of, of um, um, how long, how long I have, I have been, been, you know, uh, you know uh, sort of starting, sort of starting from from my from early, my early days, days uh, to running a space now this, sort of now this sort of you gives you sort of sets the stage, sets the for, stage for uh, uh, you know the journey, you know, that, the journey that I'm about, to, about share to share with you. So let's go so to, let's the, next go to the next here. slide here. I think I've been, I think I've been um, very lucky, very lucky because, because I was raised, I was raised in, an environment, in an environment which was which was gender neutral. Gender neutral. Uh, I was uh, also I was surrounded, also surrounded by very strong, by very women. strong women. My mother, my, mother, my aunts, my, aunts, my neighbors. My neighbors. Um, um, I mean, these women, I mean, these in, the women 60s in the sixties had a master's, had a master's or, a or a PhD. So for me, so I, for think, me it was, I think it was it was it was a very it was a very important it was very it was very important growing up as a child to not have seen, not have the, seen the difference. Uh, and these days we talk a lot about diversity, equity, inclusion. That's something I grew up. Up with and I think and that I think has, that shaped, has me shaped me into who I am today. 
Uh, in my formative years in school, I was, um, I, was, I was raised in Ahmedabad in the 1970s and the 1980s. I was surrounded by India's space pioneers, my dad being one of them. Uh, he was recruited by Vikram Sarabhai in 1967 when he returned from Germany. So the, the people who were part of my growing up milieu were the ones who started India's space program. Uh, here you can see a photograph on the on the left, which is you can see a, a rocket cone, a sounding rocket cone being carried on a bicycle in Thumba in 1996. This photograph was taken by the French photographer Henri Cartier Bresson. Um, so I, th I think the, the idea was to give you a sense of where my journey began. It sort of is around the same time when ISRO's journey began. And on the right hand side, you can see a television grab of the first Apollo landing. Um, my dad used to be in Montreal in Canada then um, on work. And he uh, used to have these wonderful slides that we would see on his slide projector growing up. And I remember very vividly this pixelated television grab of the first Apollo landing that my dad shot while he watched it on television live in Canada. So these are, these are the kind of visuals um, that went in to feed the imagination you know, of a schoolgirl who then became quite passionate about the idea of designing for living and, and working in outer space. The other uh, influence that I had as a, as a schoolgirl was contemporary architecture. So Ahmedabad, uh, back in the 70s, was a city where the textile mill owner families, the industrial families, would invite amazing contemporary architects from India and abroad to design public buildings and private residences. So I was exposed to the architecture of, in this photograph, you can see architect B.V. Doshi, who passed away a couple of years ago. I used to literally open my study window and see Doshi's vault architecture at a distance. Other than Doshi, we had Charles Correa, we had Anand Raje, we had Le Corbusier, we had Louis Kahn. So if you put architecture and space together, if you juxtapose the two, what you have is space architecture. There was no such discipline as space architecture growing up, but that's what I got interested in as a kid. And I used to have you know, a, a wonderful bicycle. I had inherited my dad's portable typewriter. Uh, and I had access to some of the finest institutes in the country within, you, know, you could say, five kilometers of where I lived. So I would bicycle over to these places. You know, there was the physical research laboratory, which Sarah had started right after independence, the Space Application Center, Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, School of Architecture, National Institute of Design, and so on. So I would go to these libraries. Uh, I would also seek out interesting people in these institutions to talk to about my ideas. Um, and being interested in the idea of living off the planet, living in environments other than our home planet, I would come up with imaginary problems of living in, in microgravity or on other planetary destinations, and I would go about solving them on, on my own. Uh, they didn't have anything to do with my curriculum as such. And the ideas that I would, the design ideas that I would then develop, I would send it by snail mail to NASA, to the European Space Agency, to universities around the world that I thought are working on ideas um, related to those design problems. And for every 10 letters I would write, I would hear back from at least two or three of them. And that sort of kept me going as a, as a schoolgirl, you know, working on these kind of ideas. Little did I know that uh, eventually I would end up starting my professional career at one of the NASA centers. And this was NASA's Johnson Space Center in Houston. I was there in 1997 when the second Hubble repair mission was happening. So we used to go to mission control in the middle of the night to watch the Hubble repair happening live uh, in space, uh, sitting in mission control in Houston. It was also the time when the United States and Russia decided to collaborate so that they could fly an American astronaut to the Russian space station Mir 
And that American astronaut would then get to spend four to six months on the orbiting Mir space station. Uh, back then, the, the United States had what we call the space shuttle fleet. There were four space shuttles in that fleet. One of them was called Atlantis, and that's the one you can see in this picture. You can see Space Shuttle Atlantis docked to the Mir space station, and we are looking at the shuttle bay from one of the large windows on the Mir space station. It's one of my favorite photographs because Mir had already been up in orbit for several years, and yet the window is pristine. And the reason is the Russians, uh, they use these large mechanical covers that you can see on the left hand side of the window to cover these windows. Uh, so so it's, it's, it's a wonderful idea to make sure that your space hardware in orbit, the longevity of your hardware, including a window like this, um, can, you know, it, it can sort of be well maintained over the years. So when Mead was deorbited in, in, um, in the early part of the millennium, Many of us in the industry were quite upset, if you ask me, because space hardware is expensive to build, to launch. So I think getting rid of Mir, uh, especially given that some of its modules were very young, was something that many of us were not uh, very happy about. After NASA Johnson, I went on to work for the International Space Station program in Boeing in Huntington Beach in Southern California. This were the early days of the International Space Program. This was 1998, when the first module of the space station was sent um, into low Earth orbit in November in 1998. And that, that module was called Zarya. That was an autonomous module which had its own power, its own uh, communication uh, module and so on. So that was the very first module that went up when I started working for Boeing. And what you see here in this picture is the uh, space station after the construction and assembly was complete. Uh, the size of the space station that you're seeing here is roughly equal to two large football fields, just to give you a sense. Um, the orange um, uh, uh, elements that you're seeing here, yellow, orange, those are the solar panels. And the white crinkly uh, panels that you see are thermal radiators. They help keep the station cool. Uh, what is interesting uh, for, you, for you to note here is the space station uh, was built by what we call piecemeal architecture. What it means is you take uh, bits of the station up on a rocket or on the space shuttle in its cargo bay and you assemble it in orbit. And the architecture of the station is also very interesting. If you see, it was built around a spine, a central spine. Um, so what I did for Boeing those three years when I was part of the space station program, I was in the international programs office. And this was the office that did international business development. So we were a small group of 12 people who would do what we call in aerospace uh, jargon, bid and proposal. We would bid for contracts with space station partner nations. There are 16 countries participating in the space station program. And we would try and sell them anything from as small as a space qualified fire extinguisher to something as large as an entire module. So after the bid and proposal phase, we would negotiate the contract. And once that's finalized, we would have to manage the international contract and eventually deliver the hardware to the client. So these three years, um, so I came into Boeing uh, having been trained as a designer, as an engineer, I have four different degrees. And at Boeing, I learned uh, international business development and how that's done in the aerospace industry. So that was an inflection point of sorts. Uh, that sort of gave me the confidence that, hey, you know, I can now go out and start my own company if I want, which is exactly what I did. In the year 2000, I left Boeing and I moved to San Francisco. Uh, in Northern California, and I started my first small company called Moonfront. Um, back then, the word startup didn't exist. Uh, and Moonfront was, you could say, an experimental venture. It was my first venture as a first generation entrepreneur. Uh, we had six partners. We all had our uh, set of interests when it comes to space. Uh, I think I should, I, I should, I should emphasize that space is vast. You know, there are 
there is you can build satellites, you can do rocket launches, you can design things for exploring space, for living in outer space. Uh, there are a whole range of space applications. So any of you out there uh, interested in doing something in the, in the space world need to figure out what is it that you're interested in. As for me, I was very passionate about human space exploration. Um, and what excites me about designing for living in outer space is on Earth, uh, we take a lot of things for granted. We take gravity for granted. We take atmospheric pressure for granted. We even take natural illumination and the entire gamut of colors that the electromagnetic spectrum brings us for granted. But in outer space, uh, as designers, as engineers, we can't take any of these environmental parameters for granted. And as you can see in this picture, uh, what you're looking at is a concept of a future lunar base. Uh, we had organized or co-organized a lunar based design workshop at one of the European Space Agency centers in the Netherlands um, called ESTEC. And we had about 60 students from around Europe, architecture students, industrial students come together to come up with these design concepts for living on the moon in the near future. And this is one of those concepts by a team called Team Copernicus. And on the moon, everything is, as you see in this rendering, it's black and white and gray. So living in the moon is not exactly a very colorful affair. And remember, moon has no atmosphere. It has no running water. So the lunar dust is very, very sharp like glass. And it gets into everything. It gets into the, the, the creases of your spacesuit. It gets into the mechanical parts of your moon buggy. Um, and if you, breathe, if you bring it into your habitat and breathe it in, it sits in your lungs. So I think designing for living in these kind of extraterrestrial environments what we designers need to keep in mind are these kind of environmental parameters and also human factors, uh, psychological factors, physiological factors, because we need to make sure that the crew is, is happy, is cohesive uh, and productive. A few years after that, while I was still living in San Francisco, I co-founded another company with a friend of mine from Vienna, and that company is called Liquifer. The, the full name is Liquifer Systems Group. Liquifer is still around. Moonfront uh, was a company which was around for seven years while I lived in San Francisco. I dissolved it in 2008 when I moved back to India. Liquifer was founded around 2004, 2005, and that company is still around. We are about to uh, launch our first book, which uh, documents the amazing portfolio of projects that we've worked on over the last 16, 17 years. So the image that you see here is a rendering from one such project called SHE, which was essentially a habitat for two astronauts. And the habitat was inspired, the design was inspired by biomimetics. You know, we look at biological systems. And if you look at the rendering here, the side petals of the habitat in a fully outfitted configuration can fold and it can shrink in volume such that it can fit on the top of an Ariane rocket because every rocket fairing on top has a certain volume and you need to design things such that it can fit the volumetrics of the rocket this is supposed to travel in. So this habitat was designed um, keeping in mind the specifications of that rocket. We also built a full-scale prototype of this habitat. And as you can see in this image, this is, this is the prototype of that rendering. And most projects in Europe are done in a consortium format. What I mean by that is it's not just the Vienna company that's involved. We usually have four or five other entities as part of the, as part of the team, as part of the project. Uh, usually it's a couple of small companies, maybe a large company, a couple of universities. So it's always a very multidisciplinary, multicultural way of designing things for living in outer space. And this prototype was then taken by road to Spain, to a place called Rio Tinto, which has um, the terrain, as you can see, has similarities with the Martian terrain. And we not only tested this habitat, we also tested a new kind of spacesuit that you can see one of our simonauts wearing in this photograph and a rover that you can see at a distance to the left of the slide. 
Similarly, when we design something for the moon, we design it in a simulation uh, where we, we, sorry, we test it in a simulated environment, which allows us to mimic reduced gravity because the moon has one sixth gravity. So here you can see one such simulation. Uh, this simulation happened in COMEX, a company in Marseille in the south of France, where we were testing this new spacesuit that had been designed and developed uh, as part of a consortium and a rover. You can also see that the simonauts in this simulation are holding these instruments in their hands, which were also designed for the simulation. And these are instruments which will help astronauts pick up samples, rock samples, uh, while they are out uh, you know, on sorties on Moon or Mars. So these are the kind of simulations that we do to test what we design. Um, I thought I would share with you a rendering which gives you a sort of a vision into the future. What, what will future habitats look like? Um, we all know that 3D printing is pretty advanced now. Uh, we have, you know, we have uh, small architectural construction that's being done with 3D printing. We have large sculptures that could be 3D printed. Uh, our company in Vienna um, also 3D prints models of the things we design on a routine basis because it's very easy these days to print 3D models on a smaller scale. What you see here is a concept of a future Martian base which um, was created in collaboration between the Vienna company and the European Astronaut Center in Cologne. This habitat was called the, the it was called Lava Hive, and it, it won a prize in one of NASA's uh, 3D printed, um, you know, future habitat competitions. So what you see here is some parts of this, this Martian base are made using local regolith, local soil, which has then been used uh, to create these 3D printed structures using lava casting and sintering. Of course, this is a future projection, uh, but this kind of hybrid architecture is going to become real uh, once the 3D printing techniques become even more sophisticated. Uh, you can also see some of the other parts of the base are parts that have been scavenged from, let's say, the descent module. The rover that you see to the left of the slide is something that has actually been designed on Earth, assembled on Earth, and has been transported on a rocket to go be part of this habitat complex. Uh, and this was one of the renderings which was my favorite during the pandemic because I would, I would show this to students and often give them um, a case study to solve. As in, let's say there's a crew of four people on this base and a contagion breaks out. So one of the crew members, um, let's say, you know, gets something like COVID. And if you are the commander of the mission, how would you then manage the missions? What would what would be the next steps? What would be the protocols? So this this became a very interesting case study during the pandemic when I used to talk to students about you know space habitats and living in outer space. In 2008, I moved back to India and I launched my third venture, which was called Earth to Orbit. So the first thing that we as a company took up was um, so India is one of a handful of nations that has launch capability. And any launch capable nation essentially has two rockets. One is a rocket that is used to launch Earth observation satellites into what we call the SSO orbit. And that in the case of India is the PSLV rocket. The other rocket is usually a heavy lifter that is used to launch communication satellites to the geostationary orbit which is a much higher orbit, 36,000 kilometers from the surface of the Earth, and it's usually a circular orbit around the equator. In India's case, that rocket is the GSLV. So when I moved back to India in 2008, there were a couple of things I did. One, I went to Trivandrum, uh, which is in the southern part of India, to meet ISRO scientists who had started working on India's human space exploration program. Uh, in 2007, a year before I moved to India, India ISRO had tested a crew capsule. Uh, it was called SRE-1. Um, and a few years later, in 2014, ISRO tested another capsule called K-1. 
CARE, the abbreviation was called CARE, and both of these capsules were essentially technology demonstrators to see what kind of re-entry technologies we need for the capsule to successfully and safely uh, re-enter the Earth's orbit and splash down when the astronauts have to return to Earth. So that, that was one of the things I did when I came back to India. And I also worked um, pro bono with one of the ISRO centers in Bangalore um, with uh, my Earth to Orbit team to come up with a list of facilities that would need to go into the residential astronaut training facility that India is planning right here in Bangalore uh, in Devanahalli. We also looked at the space requirements for the facilities and um, power requirements. So that was sort of my initial entry, re-entry into India. And having grown up with the Indian space program, I had a fairly good sense of where we are with things. So one of the other things that um, I was, you could say, smitten by is our rocket, the PSLV, which first flew in 1993. Uh, and by 2008, you could say it was a very reliable, very mature rocket in its class. So I thought, now that I'm back in India, I could leverage my friendships and connections around the world to see how we could make the PSLV one of the most sought after rockets in its class. And if you looked at the foreign payloads that the PSLV had launched from 1999 to 2008, there were several European payloads. And Europe and India have always had good bilateral relations. So usually, if a European country wants to launch on an Indian rocket, it's a fairly straightforward exercise, which begins with embassy to embassy contact and space agency to space agency contact. So as a company, we at Earth to Orbit thought, let us focus on Japan and the United States. Let's try and bring them to launch on the PSLV. So we helped launch a Japanese satellite in 2012 on the PSLV. And we also helped launch an American satellite, a Google satellite in 2016. It might sound very simple, but space is very complex as an industry. We have uh, fairly complicated regulations that we have to always navigate. And if we are dealing with the United States of America, uh, we have something called ITAR, which is a set of very stringent export control uh, regulations. So it's a regime from the Cold War times. So getting a Japanese satellite to launch on the PSLV, it took about four years. Uh, and that's usually how much it takes from the day a client comes to you to launch to the day you actually launch their satellite into orbit. And on the American side, the biggest hurdle we had was a US embargo of 1998 that was imposed on India when we conducted nuclear tests. So we had to deal with the US embargo and we had to deal with ITAR that I just mentioned, an export control um, uh, hurdle, so to speak. So it took us almost three years of soft diplomacy. I must have met more than a dozen diplomats on either side um, over three years um, and had that conversation as to why it makes sense to open up or to build a bridge between the United States and India because there are a lot of satellites that satellite makers in the US are looking for to launch as a secondary payload, not as the primary payload on a rocket, but a secondary payload. And here we had a fantastic rocket, which flew frequently, which was very reliable. So there was no reason to prevent that from happening. Anyway, after three years, we finally managed to get permission from the US State Department to launch uh, the rocket uh, it was from a startup in Stanford called Skybox Imaging. So three years to get the permission, another year to get the signatures from all the relevant entities on both sides, and yet another year. So in the fifth year, in 2014 April, we finally signed a launch agreement between Skybox, our client, and Antrix, which was then the commercial arm of the Indian Space Research Organization. And we made history. I mean, never before had a launch agreement been signed between um, Antrix and an American satellite maker. So by the time we launched that particular satellite, Google bought Skybox, and we then ended up launching a 110-kilogram Google satellite called Skysat. 
and, and history was made. So this is just to give you a sense of, I went from designing things from uh, living for living in outer space uh, to even doing international business development from the space, for the space station program, uh, all the way to doing soft diplomacy um, to make it possible for Americans to launch on the PSLV. So th that's what we sort of did in the first seven years of Earth to orbit, international launch procurement. The remaining three years, um, well, almost five years, we looked at how to use open source satellite imagery and combine it with machine learning and analytics to, to build models which could be used for Earth applications. So the two areas or the two sectors for which we developed models were agriculture and smart cities. You know, because you can use satellite imagery for a whole variety of applications. So we were looking at how we could use it to do crop forecasting for the agriculture sector. And similarly, we were looking at how can we use satellite imagery with analytics to develop models for, say, um, anything from water management to uh, rooftop horticulture uh, to solar harvesting using urban rooftops. So we were looking at how could you make cities climate smart uh, by leveraging satellite imagery and analytics. In 2021, uh, a little after the pandemic started to ease, I co-founded my, uh, I'm losing count here, but probably my fourth venture um, in the space world. I have other ventures too, uh, which is a space think tank. So this space think tank was co-founded uh, in collaboration with seven other space professionals, Indian space professionals living in different parts of the world. So the space think tank, the reason for starting a space think tank was that for the last decade after having arrived in India, I had been visiting Delhi uh, to meet ministers, to meet bureaucrats, to push for opening up of the Indian space economy, for liberalizing the Indian private sector. And finally, in 2020, 2020, the government announced their intention to bring in space reforms that would allow that to happen. So in, in that sense, it was it was wonderful news for people like me and others who had been advocating for uh, opening up India's space economy. So India has had a fantastic, a very accomplished government space program. And it was therefore important that we also let the private sector not only um, get to prosper um, and, and, and thrive in the, in the domestic market, which is largely restricted to ISRO and users of space applications you know, in different sectors, we wanted them to be able to also compete internationally. So this think tank has four, four different objectives. One is to provide policy guidance to the government and this policy guidance is based on research and stakeholder feedback. Uh, the second is to try and amplify India's voice in international fora where space law and policy decisions are being debated, discussed, um, because I think it's very important for India to play a leadership role in designing this policy landscape internationally as well. The third objective that we have is to build perspective, not just with the public, but also with the bureaucrats, with the politicians, through critical thinking, through dialogue, through debate, and through opinion making. And the fourth objective that our think tank has is to, to do whatever we need to do in order to make India a developed space economy by 2030. So the space uh, think tank, we recently launched our new website. Um, I'd invite you to all go take a look. It's called spaceportsarabhai.org. And it's named after Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, the physicist and visionary who helped launch our space program in the, in the 60s. And the photograph here that you see, uh, he's with Thomas Paine, one of the former NASA uh, administrators. They're signing an agreement um, ISRO in its initial days, uh, in, in 1963, when they launched, when ISRO launched 
uh, well, then ISRO wasn't incorporated, but INCOSPAR launched the first sounding rocket from Kerala, from Thumba. It was essentially a Nike Apache rocket, an American sounding rocket. In 1975, a few years after ISRO was incorporated, uh, India and the United States did a very unique collaboration called the SITE experiment, where they used an American satellite, ATS-6, to broadcast uh, educational and informational programs uh, by using, using television sets in very, very remote villages. So they had selected 2,400 remote villages in different parts of the country. They had uh, All India Radio create these programs, which were then broadcast via satellite directly to these remote villages. So I think uh, the US-India India cooperation goes back to the early years of ISRO. Uh, and this image is testimony to that. I think I would like to um, talk a little bit about our home planet because um, we have techno prophets today who will tell you that you know we they will they will create colonies on Mars um, and you know transport very many human beings onto other planets. But I think I think I would like to remind you all that the reality is that as of today um, there is no planet B. We often forget that the blue spaceship that we call home is one of the, the most comfortable places for humans to be. It's life-giving, it's nurturing. Uh, so I think it's very important for us to do everything we can to decelerate, to reverse uh, the climatic collapse that we are seeing around us. You must have noticed that climatic spikes have gone up. Intense weather has gotten worse every year. It's primarily because of human activities over the last couple of centuries. And if we do not take climate action, I mean, this is especially very important, not only for those of us who are, um, who, who, who are talking about it through, through our, our, our work, um, I think it's very important, especially for the millennials and uh, the Gen Zs and the Gen Alphas, to note that you will be inheriting a bruised planet. So it's also up to you how you shape your lives and activities to make sure that the Earth stays habitable for the future generations. Um, I would also like to talk a little bit about women in aerospace. So when I started out, professionally speaking, in um, 1998, the Indian Space Research Organization and NASA, in my view, had the best gender ratios. They still do. Um, ISRO has almost 12% of their cadre is women. Uh, the European space agencies back in the late 90s had very few women. Uh, that's gotten way better in the last couple of decades. Even Japan, I would say, had very few women. That's starting to improve as well. So I think it's, it's, it's important to know that th this image was taken when the Indian uh, spacecraft uh, Mangalyan arrived in Martian orbit. So you can see the jubilation in mission control in Bangalore. And this particular photograph went viral. So then friends of mine from around the world, um, they, they wrote to me saying that it was wonderful to see women in silk saris and flowers in their hair celebrating the arrival of a spacecraft in Martian orbit. And I think it was also a reminder that the Indian space program has had amazing women who have contributed to the space program over the last 50 plus years. This is one of uh, my interviews in one of uh, the Indian newspapers where I have uh, talked about the hope that one of our next chairpersons of the space agency could be a woman. We've had women scientists in ISRO head entire rocket programs, entire satellite programs. So there's no reason why uh, one of them should not go ahead and, you know, be, be the chief of the, of the space agency in the near future. Uh, this is an image uh, taken by the navigation camera on the recent uh, lunar mission that India just concluded. Um, this was Chandrayaan-3, and we had the Vikram lander that you see in this photograph, 
that not only did a soft landing at roughly 69 degrees south, so near polar, near south polar region, it was a near precision landing. Um, I emphasize the word soft landing and precision landing because that is still a huge technological challenge when it comes to, uh, you know, making it to other planetary destinations. So it was, it was an amazing feat, not just for ISRO, not just for India, but I would say for the entire world, because this is the first time a craft landed um, in, in, a, in a region very close to the South Pole. The previous landings um, that have happened uh, have always been sort of uh, north of the equator or south of the equator. And the South Pole is of particular significance because those of us who are interested in seeing a human presence on the moon, uh, the, the southern pole, the, the, the polar region here that we're looking at has craters uh, and parts of these craters are in a permanent shadow. And that's where we have had confirmed reports of uh, water ice. And water is going to be a very important element if we have to, um, you know, not only have a small outpost on the moon, but also be able to use the moon as a stepping stone to go further out into the solar system. So we can use the water for uh, drinking, for making fuel, and, and for a bunch of other reasons. This is a photograph taken uh, after a splashdown of the second crew capsule that was tested by ISRO in 2014, which I mentioned earlier in my talk. So this particular capsule is, again, like I said, a technology demonstrator. And now ISRO is working on what we call, we, we, we are going to refer to as Gaganyan 1, a human ferry, a capsule, which can carry a crew of three astronauts into low Earth orbit and back. Um, and this photograph was to remind you that although the Gaganyan mission was delayed a bit because of the pandemic, we are hoping to see uh, a first uncrewed launch of the Gaganyan spacecraft, I think in the second half of next year. And I, I'm particularly very excited about this because this is uh, sort of the program finally coming to a point where we will see uh, humans uh, in orbit using the Gaganyan spacecraft. This is a favorite recent picture of mine. Uh, you're looking at Valley Funk in her early 80s. She finally made it to what we call the edge of space uh, in, a, in the Blue Shepherd uh, rocket by Blue Origin in, uh, I believe it was 2021. So the reason I wanted to share this image of Valley Funk with you is because in 1959, uh, when NASA selected the seven astronauts for Pro Project Mercury, they were all white men um, and they were all fighter pilots. So what happened around then, there were these women who were also interested in being astronauts. And one of the NASA flight surgeons, Dr. Lovelace, he took 13 women pilots through the same physiological and psychological screening that NASA was using for the male astronauts and showed that all of those 13 women who went through those uh, through, through the astronaut screening, this was an unofficial program, not part of NASA, but outside of NASA, they were all fit to fly. How, and, and Valley Funk was one of them. Uh, later on, there was a movie made on these women, um, you know, women astronaut candidates, so to speak. And the movie was called Mercury 13, as opposed to the Mercury 6 that NASA had chosen. And I think India probably needs its own Mercury 13, because even though we have the highest number of women pilots in the world, I mean, India has about 14% of our pilots are women as compared to, say, the United States, where I believe around 4 to 5% of their pilots are women. And yet, when uh, ISRO put out a call for astronauts to fly on Gaganyan, the first call only allowed men to apply. So I'm hoping that maybe we could also do an experiment like Mercury 13 and have women pilots go through the same screening tests which the male Indian astronauts went through to show that they are as fit to fly. Uh, and there's no reason why the astronaut selection should not be opened up to the women of the country. And this is my last slide. It's, a, it's one of my favorite photographs taken by a German journalist 
who flew in from Hamburg to Sriharikota to see a PSLV launch. Uh, he could not get permission to go inside the launch complex and, and see it. So what he did is he, cho he chose to stay outside of the, uh, the spaceport complex. Uh, you know, there are, this is this near Sriharikota, you have an island called the Pulikut Island. So he stood outside with the women that you see here in the picture and girls and saw the PSLV soar into the skies. And I love this photograph because I think it also reminds you of how space um, inspires not just those who work in the space industry, it inspires each one of us. And I think it's wonderful to always see a rocket launch live as opposed to see it on television. So I would encourage all of you out there, given the chance, go to Sri Arikota and, and see a rocket launch live. I think that's one of the most beautiful experiences you can have. And I'll leave you with that quote from Oscar Wilde, which he said, and wonderfully so, we're all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. And with that, I will hand it back to Nikita. Nikita, over to you. Thank you so much, Sushmita, for taking us through your entire journey, in fact. And uh, of course, I, I knew you uh, from a long time, but then there were a lot of things that were pretty new and surprising for me. And I'll tell you what are they as in when we uh, move towards the Q&A session. But then I, again, thank you so much uh, for taking us through. I think one thing um, which is still going around my head is that, you know, the women in STEM and you started saying at that time in 16s, you 60s, you had people around you who, who had doctorates. Yeah. Them, and I'm pretty sure uh, that that's a big thing at that time. And in fact, it's a big thing even now. Right. And that's why the entire world is now focusing on girls in STEM, women in STEM. STEM has become STEAM. <laughs> And uh, after looking at your presentation, I saw you have uh, explored arts, that's architecture, technology, entrepreneurship as a <laughs> diplomat, the law, everything around you. So I wanted you to tell um, something to our young girls who would be watching this video. What is that you want them to do uh, in, in the space domain, be it the entire steam that that we just spoke about. So I think I think Nikita, it's uh, not only a question of uh, girls taking to studying science and engineering. Um, there, there are two things here that I would like to tell all of them and not not just young girls, but also young boys who are in smaller cities, you know, tier two, tier three cities who don't have easy access to say uh, good labs or, you know, experts that they can easily talk to. Uh, I, I think there are a couple of things. One is don't draw a line between uh, the sciences and the arts. Uh, I think it's very important that all of these dis disciplines sort of talk to each other. Um, as you can see from my own professional journey, um, having an understanding of architecture and human factors was as important as understanding systems engineering or how, you know, uh, you know what, what are the engineering problems that you need to keep in mind while designing safe space habitats. So I think young people out there, one, be interested in the sciences, in the arts, keep your mind open, stretch your imagination, because often the problems you solve will be multidisciplinary you will need to put on these different hats to solve a problem. Second, I would like to say um, nothing is impossible if you set your mind to it. And sometimes if there is something you want to do which doesn't exist, go out and invent it. You know, as a schoolgirl, I wanted to do something like space architecture. It wasn't even a discipline back then. It took almost 15, 20 years for a handful of us from around the world to make space architecture a recognized professional discipline in the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. So two things. One is keep, keep an open mind and be open to all of these different ways of thinking and solving problems. And second is go out and do what your heart wants you to do. Um, and for that, of course, you have to study uh, and all that. But I think what I'm trying to say is if something doesn't exist, go out and create it from scratch. It, it's doable. 
Thank you so much. In fact, that was my next question. But then students, I want all of you to know that, you know, every talk we, we we've been listening, uh, last talk, we had Deepika Jaikodi who spoke about space law, and then we had space medicine. So I'm pretty sure you all explored something new that is space architecture. And uh, uh, this is the future, if I'm not wrong. So Shmita, next few years, we, we're going to be on moon and Mars, and this is going to be a big thing. And we want people to explore this as one of the opportunities. Yes, no, ab absolutely. I think, I think just like you said, uh, space architecture uh, essentially is looking at how do you design safe, survivable, habitable, happy outposts in outer space, you know, because we uh, astronauts have to live in isolation and confinement for several months at a time. So we need to make sure that not only is, is the habitat going to be safe and survivable, but also a place where psychologically, physiologically, uh, and in terms of group dynamics, it, things work out in a, in a way that the mission becomes successful. So yeah, space architecture is going to be very important in the coming years. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, right. And, and one, one thing uh, that I, you know, uh, I know about you is you travel a lot and you guide several people, you talk and you've been observing different, uh, say, space agencies working in different ways, different startups, pretty sure different processes that each one of them would be following. Is there something that you've loved most about something or someone and you, you feel that this has to be followed by everyone in spite of any country, any organization and something like that? Uh, I think every country, every geography has its specialties. So I can give you uh, maybe three different examples from three different continents. Uh, I think what, what, I like, what I like about the United States of America is uh, the optimism with which ideas are received. So even if you have a crazy idea, it's perfectly okay to go out and raise funds for it and try to make it happen. There's less cynicism in a country like the United States because it's a young country. It's only been around for 200 years um, uh, as in, as in, you know, post-colonization. So people are less cynical there. Um, so I like that about the United States. What I like about Europe is that all of the projects that I've engaged in in Europe have been a project where we have people from different parts, different countries in Europe coming together. So we have, let's say in a project, we have the French, the Latvians, the Swiss, the Austrians, and the Germans working together. And what is cool about that kind of a consortium uh, approach to designing things is you bring in multicultural influences to designing things, which I think is very important. I mean, think about the crews that live on the International Space Station or the crews that will travel to Mars or to Moon. They will be multinational crews. So I think taking, bringing in these different cultural influences into the design of future systems is very important as well. India, what I love about India is the youth the energy, the chaos, uh, in a good way, I think chaos is wonderful, uh, that we have in the country because there is this level of ferment, there's this hunger for new things and knowledge that I find diminishing in some of the other parts of the world. So I think India has um, this raw energy. Uh, and when I, when I um, quietly mentor some of the young people who are running startups today, um, it's that energy which even energizes me, actually, and nothing can stop them. I mean, some of our startups here in India are doing cutting edge stuff. You know, we have a startup that's making the world's best single wall carbon nanotubes. We have a startup that's working on green propulsion. We have a startup that's building hyperspectral satellites. So I think India's demographic is a very powerful thing. And it, it, it is a wonderful place to be, if you ask me, when, when you have these young people doing fantastic things. decades of experience that you have in this different domains of space um, and you've been guiding uh, uh, all the startups and the entrepreneurs like you said and I've been seeing you guiding them as well uh, you have observed is there something that you have always felt that this uh, must be worked on right there must be some challenge some some idea that you've been thinking of which 
it has not happened so far and which you want it to be done which our young people out here watching could think of that they could do in the future it could be very unrealistic right now but it's okay as you said you want everyone to be crazy so yeah you have <laughs> yeah, no no there that. there are there are such things of course there are there's always there's always scope for improvement so i think there are several things but i think i'll talk about one thing so that it it sort of uh, stands out um i think it's very important for youngsters out there to think about planetary ethics you know just as in the big tech industry we are now in the last several years we are starting to hear about ethics that go with algorithms right because social media for example we have to look at how it is affecting the mental health of our young people uh and that's where the the whole question of ethics comes in i think a similar way if you project it onto space space exploration space utilization we have to think about planetary ethics so for example you know in low earth orbit we have more than 300 million man made debris objects orbiting the earth and low earth orbit has become a very dangerous place because of this kind of debris we are similarly now about to you know sort of land humans on the moon and you know most likely we'll be setting up moon bases so we have to think about the ethical uh concerns that you that you would have as an exploring species that goes out and settles other parts of the solar system so the questions that we need to ask ourselves is should we be launching mega constellations in low earth orbit uh should one company be allowed to send up you know uh thousands of satellites what does it do to the debris signature what does it do about environmental responsibility from these companies or governments for that matter similarly on the moon i mean are there laws to protect the pristine environment of the moon are there laws to ensure that the moon will be treated as a cosmic commons are there laws to ensure that we won't be doing resource extraction in a way that will you know just like we do mining on earth you know environment i mean whether it's earth or other planetary systems we really need to as a species think about the ethical consequences of our actions so so i think planetary ethics could and might even become a new discipline that will feature in everything we do in outer space and i think it should i think i think we have uh, neglected our home planet and there are there's every possibility that we will try and monetize um you know our trips to other parts of the solar system so we need to watch out wonderful i know we had this uh, subject uh, moral signs value education in our schools uh, which was to lead a good life here on earth and i see you're talking about now taking care of the earth and then the entire space when we go on so uh that's 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 really nice to know if i if i can and if i can add in, something here um nikita i think the indigenous communities around the world uh if you look at their lifestyles they live in in harmony with nature they align with nature they never take more than what they need and i think if you look at industrial economies it's always about monetizing the hell out of everything and that is what leads to the kind of environmental crisis that we are in now so i think we have a lot to learn from the traditional wisdom of these indigenous communities that are in india and in other parts of the world absolutely that's right and uh, remember i told you right after the talk there was something which was very shocking for me um you know that we, we both studied in isu where isu alums and uh, when i was uh, doing my ssp back in 2019 we were taken around uh, the campus and uh, we were we, we made we were made to walk in that uh, she prototype that you have made and kept which i realized which i got to know that it was you you were behind that and i'm so happy about that and uh, um i want you to uh, tell your experience at isu and this education that it's providing at the same time space education that's required for today's generation right we all know how important the space has become and how inspiring the space space is turning into for the younger generation beat with the recent chandrayaan 3 uh, successful uh, being successful and then we have gaganyaan that's coming up you know that 
students are in that excited state <laughs> and uh, yeah what, what do you comment on that? so just a quick disclaimer about the she habitat so uh, the we for 17 years and i was actively involved for the first 12 years uh, in project so the she project happened after those 12 years so i was not directly involved with she uh, but i did go to one of the she outfitting and testing things that happened in the south of france uh, i've i've i mean after the first 12 years i've been more of an ambassador for the company than an active participant in projects but yes for those of you who uh, will make it to strasbourg you should definitely go and see the prototype of the she habitat which is usually parked in what we call a high bay it's a kind of a garage or a hangar uh, where she habitat rests when it is not being used for experiments and and simulations now coming back to your question i think space should become or rather space exploration should become part of school curricula uh, we should not limit school textbooks to only talk about you know the 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 schematic showing the solar system and so on the school curriculum should be a little more dynamic than that what should happen is the the textbooks you know that are used around the schools in the world should include all of these newer missions that have happened in the last you know in the last 30 40 years in a way that students are able to go and use either their smartphones or their computers or their lab computers not everybody has a computer at home but to go and see the imagery uh, and read up on those missions because there is so much information on the web and i think the school curriculum needs to leverage that and allow students to connect with space exploration from their early years not just you know written textbooks but also go out and have a way to explore those things visually and you know in terms of information on the web i think that connect is missing and i think it's important for students to know about all the current stuff and what's happened in the recent past as well not just what's happened you know in the last century wonderful in fact that's something that uh, uh, we've been focusing on from 2016 in fact like i went through entire uh, science textbooks of all the boards like you said it only speaks about history and i was very keen on making sure that students must learn about what's happening today and what what is that that they have for their future and you as you rightly mentioned few of the domains that are very important students i want you all to focus on all of those things and see if there is something of your interest if not now but later um kindly explore and uh, uh keep 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 exploring like sushmita's topic is born to ex and and just a quick a quick suggestion you know when you're on the internet assuming you have access to the internet you can just do for example if you're interested in the moon you can look up moon missions and then you will see the missions that the united states did that japan has done that the european space agency has done that india has done so it's very easy to do those searches you know i grew up in the pre email era when we didn't even have emails forget internet uh so i think i think do that nothing should stop you from going out and exploring using the web as a tool the web is is a fantastic portal into into knowledge and information and and you should really make the best of it absolutely thank you sushmita again for uh taking us through your journey and answering all these questions that uh, most of our audience had and uh Thank you so much for your time. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, students, I want you all to follow uh, Dr. Sushmita Mohanty on on social media. She's very active. She keeps sharing the updated information, and and I want you all to uh, keep exploring uh, space just like Sushmita Mohanty. And uh, again, thank you from the entire SSCRD team, Sushmita. Thanks for having me, it was a real pleasure, Nikita. and i hope that those of you uh, who who are listening to this talk you will go out and do something something that hasn't happened before something that looks very difficult but something that will open up uh ways for humanity to not only physically explore you know the the different parts of our solar system and beyond but even mentally you know stretch your imagination thank you very much thank you very much and uh, uh, audience thank you so much for joining us and you'll have to wait until we bring in another guest 
who would talk about another topic about space. Thank you so much for joining and we will wrap up here. Bye everyone. Bye, thank you.